I just want to remind us that we've now moved from talking about the innovations of technologies and policies as such, and we're moving towards scaling up. This is how impact occurs, and this is really what we're all about, is getting impact on the ground. Whether the ground is in the government policy offices, it's convincing the private sector to become more involved, or whether it is just trying to find new areas of innovation that we can't even envisage at this stage. So this panel is concerned with policies on innovation. We have three persons. First of all, we have uh, Ismahen Elouafi from the Director General of the International Centre for Biosaline Agriculture in the United Arab Emirates. Welcome. Kei Otsuku, Professor from Kobe University in Japan. And Mengshan Shen, the Chair of the State Food and Nutrition Consultant Committee and the former Secretary of the Leading Party Group of the Chinese Academy of Agricultural Science in China. In the latter case, Meng Shan Shan will speak through his translator to us. So rather than have a long prologue from the chair, we're going to head straight into four minute presentations, four and a half at the maximum. Please, Esmaan. So thank you very much. Thank you for uh, the invitation. So I want to first, my key messages, I have two key messages, but before that, I have a dichotomy first. So we just assume that most of the technologies that we had already have reached the people in the South, and that people have taken advantage of it. Whereas we have to recognize that most of the technologies that we think for granted in the North have never reached the people in the South. And unfortunately, they have not taken advantage of it, and it didn't make their life better. So let's hope that those new disruptive technologies we are talking about will reach worldwide and will give benefit to the people in the South. And my two key messages is the first one is that we are at a crossroad. I do see that the coupling of the huge advancement in genomics that was presented by Ren, nanotechnology, and the computational technology, the big data, make us that we are at really able to do discoveries that we were not able to do five, 10 years ago. Think about artificial intelligence, for example, that took a huge heap from 2016 only. And my second key message is that for me, genomics is one of the most important technologies that will make a difference in terms of nutrition and food security. And the reason behind is that in the old days, we used to spend so much time and so much money on breeding. Whereas right now, with genomics, animal breeding and plant breeding are going to be difficult, different. Because before, and I'm a breeder, you need to do thousands and thousands of genotypes, thousands and thousands of cross. You need to phenotype them in many, many environments. And that's one of the reasons why Great Revolution took off and the neglected underutilized species went back. It's because it's too expensive to breed new varieties. So I think if we apply genomics, and it has to be applied, as Koshi said, in different ecosystem, we could make a difference. Because we could bring the crops that we forgot about, be it the manioc in Africa, or the yam in Africa, or the quinoa and chichiwa in Latin America, we could bring them back we could breed them very quickly and make them available for the people. And of course, the whole value chain has to be developed at that time. We have to make sure that we link the consumers and create those consumers. Remember that we talk about the consumer like if it's a free man or free woman. The reality of things, we are creating those consumers. Marketing is creating those consumers. Multinational are creating what they want. So let's try to stabilize it as a, a local. Instead of coffee paste, let's give the communities the right to develop the crops that they want. And hopefully with the awareness of the importance of nutrition, we could do that. So uh, lastly, within the genomics, I think the gene editing technology that came available now and making huge disruptive uh, new product, be it in cows or in plant, will make really a game changer. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Professor Quai. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm a professor in Japan, also senior advisor to DG of IFPRI, without pay. Without pay. <laughs> uh, so for me, innovation should include all the changes that can contribute to accelerating uh, the end of hunger and malnutrition. So the question is how we can realize the innovations. I think there is only one way, that is investment in human capital by means of information campaign, training, and education. Already lots of people talked about the need to change perception of uh, uh, consumers about the uh, linkage among food, nutrition, and health. So I don't have to repeat it. But one thing I want to uh, point out is that in the case of Japan, and Japan is a very, very unique country. The incidence of obesity did not, does not increase with the growth in income. Why? Because of the campaign the, about nutrition for our consumers, also inve invested a lot in education of nutri nutrition specialists. Thousands of them have been generated, and they uh, uh, diffused uh, uh, right ideas about the uh, knowledge, about the uh, health, uh, nutrition, and food. So once perceptions of uh, consumers change, next actor who should react are the agro dealers and agro processors. We tend to assume that those guys are very efficient guys. But according to the recent studies of uh, development economics, management of enterprises in developing countries in general is very, very poor. And the managers are not knowledgeable about the important things. So I strongly recommend that we should invest in human capital of traders, agro-processors, and agro-dealers. That is very important. The next important, and probably the most important thing is to, to shift the production from uh, staple foods to uh, non-staple foods, which uh, uh, Howdy emphasized, is investment in human capital of farmers themselves. The production of staple food is relatively easy and technology has been established, and the farmers have a lot of experience. But when it comes to the production of uh, vegetables, fruits, uh, livestock products, and so on, it's new. Very often it's new. And sometimes good seeds are not available, good fertilizers are not available, and farmers do not know when fertilizer should be applied, and what kind of fertilizer, and so on and so forth. And contract farming, as uh, Eleni mentioned, is one way to disseminate new ideas to farmers. But under uh, contract farming, farmers possibly receive inputs, possibly receive instructions, but how can they be much better off significantly by just accepting? No, we have to transform subsistence farmers into entrepreneurs. That is critically important. And as uh, uh, Howdy mentioned, relative prices of uh, non staple foods are much more expensive than, than uh, staple foods in developing countries. So there is obviously lack of adequate investment in research and extension. In fact, CG fo CGIR focuses on staple crops, not, not the, the uh, nutritious uh, non staple foods. We have to shift the focus of uh, research area from uh, uh, staple foods to uh, non-staple food as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Menchancha. I'm very glad to have this opportunity to share with you with some of Chinese particular practices and experiences in food and nutrition development. My English is not good. My college helped me. I think we've been in Chinese for 40 years. The agriculture has made a huge advance. The Chinese people have 7 million people in the world. 提前实现了联合国减贫和减少饥饿人口的千年目标。我们的经验和做法。Forty-five point. 
In the past uh, 40 years, China's agriculture has made tremendous progress, which has strongly supported the country's e economic and social development, effectively guaranteed the food consumption needs of urban and rural residents, uh, and improved nutritional status of the nation. In particular, 740 million rural people have been lifted out of poverty, and the United Nations Millennium Development Goals on poverty reduction and zero hunger has been achieved ahead of schedule. Our experience can be summarized in the following five aspects. First one is implementing the national food security strategy to ensure the self-sufficiency of cereal grains. The second one is launching the science and technology support action, addressing key challenges in green varieties, cultivation technology, agriculture mechanization and agriculture extension models constantly improving green yield and agricultural output efficiency. The third one is mobilizing farmers through reform and policy impetus, including the household contract responsibility system, the, appro the, the appropriate scale of land management, the integration of primary, secondary, and tertiary industries, the supply side reform, promoting green development in agriculture and providing farmers more impetus in agricultural production. Fourth one is publishing three outlines of food nutrition development, which have played an active guiding role in improving environment for food nutrition development, enhancing the comprehensive product production capacity of food and upgrading the food consumption and the nutritional status of con consumers. Last but not least, seizing no effort in poverty reduction and social security enhancement, the precess poverty alleviation policies were adopted. Each poor household has got its own profile established with household-specific plans developed to help lift them out of poverty. Specific measures include agribusiness development, educational and cultural programs, and public welfare benefits on top of social security programs. And last, let me give you a typical example. 就是我们推广了这个学生的营养改良计划 the, the central government has initiated a nationwide nutrition improvement plan for compulsory education students in rural areas in the past eight years 159 point billion RMB were embarked for these programs benefiting 36 million students from 1,034,000 schools, covering 1,590 countries in 29 provinces of China. Thanks to this program, rural students now have enough and healthy food. Their nutritional status was improved and physical fitness maintained. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for a comprehensive discussion in such a short time. I have a few questions of the panel. Mm -hmm. If I could start, start with you, uh, Ismahan, please. You mentioned technologies, particularly genetic technologies, of which, in which you're an expert. Which of these technologies can be applied now and what are being developed that can be applied in the future. And I'm also thinking about the Biosaline Institute for plants which are growing in those areas which are not being used at present. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think for many years we have been talking about market assist selection. So how would you speed up the process of selection using genomics? But I think gene editing, it's quite different. Gene editing, it's once you know the gene instead of 
trying to do again hundreds of crosses to, in, to insert the gene is that you could know what's the switch off and on and you could change the sequence to make the gene express what you want. So I think gene editing, it's ready right now. Uh, and it has actually, there are a few crops that have been already developed in gene by gene editing. And there is a cow actually that was already uh, altered by gene editing. So I think gene editing, it's really a game changer. So, and in, in that perspective, so gene discovery will take another leap. Mm -hmm. So if we talk about gene salinity, for example, and that's where I work, it's ICBA International Center of Biosaline Agriculture. What we have been trying to do for the last 20 years, it's provide, go back to the biodiversity and look for crops that could grow with saline water. And the idea behind it is that one of the biggest limitations of agriculture today, it's fresh water. So what if we could produce with seawater? And we have been focusing on a certain crops, and one of them is salicornia, that we can use literally seawater to, to grow it. So with the gene editing, and with the discovery now, with the whole genome sequencing, and as a matter of fact, we are doing right now the whole genome sequencing of salicornia, if we find the gene, we understand it, we can eventually find the same gene in other crop that has no salinity tolerant, but we can switch it and then it became saline tolerant, and hence the limitation of fresh water became less of a, of a limitation for, for food security and for food production. Thank you very much for that. And I would like to add something because the Biosiline Centre also has Disticlus, which is a useful pasture species that needs salt to grow. Mm -hmm. can be irrigated by seawater, as I understand it. You will know more than me. And this provides greater animal protein and micronutrients in areas that are highly saline where marginalised people rely on livestock products. Absolutely, Lizzie. As, as a matter of fact, most of the crop that we have been looking at our forages, because in the grand scheme of things, forages has more salinity tolerance than many other grains or vegetables, and hence, this is very good, good, good addition. This lectus is very interesting. It takes about 60 to 70% of salinity of the sea. Good, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Professor Kay, could I ask you, in your capacity as an unpaid advisor to <laughs> IFPRI, <laughs> The enabling environment. What is the appropriate enabling environment for these technologies to be converted from innovations into action, into impact? What helps things be actually adopted? Um, important thing is the public sector investment in human capital mm -hmm. for both farmers mm -hmm. and agro-processors. They need knowledge, and that is lacking. And also, the many agro-processing industries are clustered, located in the same areas. There are many companies producing the same thing in the smaller area. Each company waits for other companies to innovate. Yeah. In the end, no company innovates. That is a situation which often observed in Sub-Saharan Africa and as far as I know, Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good, thank you. And Dr. Men Shan Chen, yeah. uh, could I ask you a question, please? Which of the new food system technologies can contribute to accelerated progress for developing countries in general, from your experience in China? I want to give you a chance 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 to give you a 这个解决机构，解决我们的营养，开辟了一个新的路径，提供了很多，呃，模式和产品。我想请我的同事把这方面的工作介绍一下。我是这个项目的首席专家。In China's experience, I think it is a commercialization of potato products as staple food. Uh, now I'm leading a program uh, for this, uh, 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 leading this program, and this program is very efficiency uh, in solving the uh, hunger and hunger and malnutrition. And this uh, program is started uh, uh, three years ago in 2014. Uh, China launched this national key program to establish uh, a technology system to support uh, the commercialized production of potato as stable food. 
so, so far, more than uh, 300 varieties of new potato products has been developed. The steamed bread and rice noodles, which are normally made with wheat flour or rice powder, now has got potato uh, as an ingredient. Some local specialists, such as uh, fermented rice cake, rice noodles, and green pancake, can also be made with potato. New food technologies for potato products have created new growth points for potato consumption and injected in patterns for potato plantation and potato product com commercialization. It is estimated that the plantation area for potato could be increased by 30% in the next five years. Potatoes as a nutritious crop Carter's will to the needs of consumption stru structure, upgrading in China, and the diversification of stable food. Potatoes are drought and cold tolerant and adaptable to poor conditions. It is Im important crop to increase total food production and guarantee the food security of China. Potatoes also uh, resources efficiency and the eco uh, conditions of water and the uh, fertilizer input. The protein output per unit area is twice of wheat, 1.3 times of rice, and 1.2 times of maize. Thus, it is a good choice for agriculture green development. Moreover, 70% of poverty stricken areas in China are major potato production areas. So commercialization uh, potatoes as a staple food bring about new opportunities for those areas to eradicate poverty. So I would like to uh, give additional uh, uh, comments that yesterday I learned and heard from the senator of Chile that he hold a kind of, uh, he called junk food. If uh, it is made by Chinese potatoes, that will be much more healthier. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, next time, if uh, if you have the opportunity to visit China, I will provide you a, a kind of a diversity of the uh, food made by potato. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. <laughs> This, this means that you will have 500 people to, to feed. No problem. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> OK. Just quickly, uh, Ismahan, could I ask you for any further comments on this subject? So I think really we are mostly talking here about diet and diversification of diet. So I think because the problem is really big, the solution there is no one size fit all. So we will need to diversify the diet from plants, from animals, from biofortified crops, how do you, from fisheries. So it is. it has to be diversified. At the same time, we have also to diversify the agriculture systems. So the monoculture, it's one model that we all adopted. And there is thousands of reasons why we adopt it. But right now, I think what we are, the focus is on nutrition. To get to the nutrition, we have to have diversified agriculture systems, and we have to develop them. And that's, it's a local and national program duty to do it. So there will be innovation that are done at the global level, but there should be uh, a customization, and there should be a development at the local level to make sure that that's happened. And that's why I think the new innovation, be it controlled environment or be it gene editing, they are less costly than the technologies that came in the 80s or the 90s. So it's much more easier right now to adopt them, take advantage of them, and couple them with our indigenous knowledge, which is the biodiversity and the crop that we have left behind. Thank you very much. Kai, one short comment before we close. Um, Probably, most likely, next year I'll become an advisor to the government of, of Pakistan about transformation of agriculture. I plan to apply what I told here 
to the development of uh, agriculture in, in Pakistan for the coming several years. So please keep watching what's going to happen in Pakistan. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The impact on the ground will be observed. Well, thank you to the whole panel. I think this has been uh, a, an interesting way to round off the discussion about startups, business, government, policy, and how we in interact with new technologies. We've covered neglected crops. We've covered marketing and the aspect of uh, changing human behavior in this, and talked about the nutrients more than the staple crops. We're already getting somewhere. This is innovation amongst the people that are engaged in food production and the continuous food production in the future. We're not talking about the same old things. We are innovating in our own minds about how we think about things. We have had two excellent keynote speakers. Thank you very much to Ren and Howdy. We have had two excellent panels. Please join me in thanking this panel and all of the participants.